Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. John Samuel, welcome to the conversation today. Thank you, John. I'm glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from North Carolina. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about organizational DEI efforts generally, but more specifically even among the disabled community. Uh, that's a population I think that often doesn't get a lot of attention when we're having these conversations. Uh, so I think this will be, be a really great dialogue today as we try to unpack some of the challenges and issues facing those with disabilities in the workplace. As we get started, I wanted to share John's bio with everybody. John Samuel is the co-founder and CEO of Abler, where he focuses on helping organizations be more inclusive by removing the barriers that have hindered people with disabilities from accessing education, retail, entertainment, and employment. John's passion for his work is very personal as he is blind and wants to make sure the obstacles he has faced are removed for others. And I could go on with his background, uh, but I'm going to pause there, John. And is there anything you would like to highlight from your own background or personal context before we dive on in? No, I appreciate that, John. You know, I think, I mean, my work, as I mentioned, really it comes from the fact that I am blind. It's something that I hid for many years of my life. You know, as I was losing my sight, it was something I mm. was ashamed and embarrassed about because. I didn't know anyone who was blind. I, you know, didn't know anything about it. So as I was losing my sight, I, I decided to keep it a secret. And, you know, it, it's that lived experience, which has helped me um, realize how I can make an impact on the community that I shunned for so long. I would love to to learn more from your personal <laughs> perspective, but also from clients you work with. And, yeah, you know, what what is it, uh, you know, that that creates this environment where people who are dealing with disabilities don't feel comfortable um letting that be known you know or you feel you feel worried about being passed over for job opportunities and promotions you feel worried about how people respond to you um, how they'll interact with you if people will treat you like a normal person or they're going to treat you like a victim like i remember i imagine there's kind of all these things going on there could you speak to that a little bit yeah i mean all of those things you just mentioned are what's going to one's mind at least i don't want to speak for all people with disabilities sure, I'll speak sure. to to my own experience those all those questions you just you know talked about that's what was going through my head i didn't want to be outed i didn't want people to know because i didn't want to be missed out on an opportunity i didn't want to be treated differently and i you know everyone wants to be a sense of belonging right and that was yeah. something that i wanted to feel like i wanted to to have a career just like my friends like everyone else i wanted to be able to go get an education just like everyone else but, you know, I think the challenge I faced was that I didn't see anyone like me around, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't see anyone with a disability. So I was like, okay, that's not something that's normal. Let me just kind of stay, let me kind of hide. Let me stay in the closet of being a person with a disability. But I think that, you know, once you start to open up, people are like, oh, I can relate to that. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's not there. We just don't talk about it because I think there's a fear of the, of no, right? People are fearful of saying the wrong thing. But once we can start to talk openly about it, we can have these this open dialogue. Pe more people will be like, oh, I'm going through something similar. It may not be blindness. It may be another, you know, a cognitive mm -hmm. disability. It may be something else. But unless we have those open dialogue and make it a subject that's not taboo, then it's, I think that's how we're going to make some changes. Yeah. And, and, you know, as you're highlighting your own personal example, people... Yeah can get really good at, you know, creating coping mechanisms to deal with whatever challenge they're facing to, so it's not obvious a lot of times to others around you. Uh, I, I'm thinking of a, a personal friend of mine back when we were in college and yeah, we were friends for a couple of years before I knew yes. that he, he, he was, he wasn't completely blind, but he was largely blind <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and it was deteriorating. Right. And, That's correct. and he, he, he was very good at, at just coping and getting through without really people noticing. 
Um, and I, I do work with a nonprofit around adult literacy. Um, it's a totally different topic, but but the 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 same kind of element of of That's you know right. you can think about how how adults they don't want people to know that they are they are illiterate, um, but they've gotten through life up to that point obviously being able to get through school, being able to like navigate and go grocery shopping and just do all the things that adults do. And you, you just develop these tremendous coping strategies um, to, to sidestep, you know, whatever the, the inconvenience might be based on, on a particular disability, or in this case, you know, uh, uh, learning disability, or perhaps yeah. just, just not having that, that skill. Um, as organizational leaders, I think if we can recognize yeah. that this is where people are coming from it, it's not an act of deception right it's 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 wanting to feel safe it's wanting to feel included it's wanting to feel like this sense of belonging and a fear that all of that could go away if people know truly about your condition or your situation yeah. uh and that can apply to all forms of different kind of health issues that can ha- uh, apply to all forms of different disability issues of course traditional types of outward manifesting DEI characteristics of race, ethnicity, gender, et cetera. All of these things feed into the same thing. Like people, people just want to belong. They want to be able to contribute. They don't want people to make assumptions about them, um, about what they're capable of. And, and so I, it really behooves us as leaders to just to make sure we create those safe environments where people feel more safe to come out when they feel comfortable. Uh, and then we can mutually support each other and, yeah. and do awesome stuff and, and not have these artificial limitations that don't need to be there. Like you're a completely successful, capable person. You don't need to, to hide the fact that you're blind. Right. And, uh, yeah. same thing with, with whatever, Thing. anyone listening who has your own we, everyone has their stuff and everyone has their things that are challenging and we can own that and we can lean into it and and we can we can leverage those things we don't need to hide from them for sure right we're all like you said we all have our stuff you can just say yeah. blank what is that but if organizations understand that and work together to create this safe space this sense of belonging and then also say okay you don't you know when you hide that or come up with your own coping mechanism, I mean, that's a lot of weight. That's a lot of pressure on you. Mm-hmm. Let's take that off. Because if you're performing at this level right now while not giving your full self, right. what happens if we give you the tools? What happens if we set you up for success? Think about what that person can do, right? That's what organizations can say. Look, if I support you in this way, my ROI is going to be ridiculous. Because right mm-hmm. now you're you're delivering and you're hiding, you're carrying that on yourself. Let's share that burden. Yeah, it's a it's a tremendous amount of like physical and mental energy that goes yes. into coping and hiding, right? Um, it does. So if you, if you can release that, that that you you really can unlock people's potential. Well, let's talk now more specifically about some of the work you're doing with Abler and working with yeah. organizations. What are some of those major obstacles that you see specifically for people with disabilities that they're facing, whether it's education or career and uh, being within an organizational setting? Yeah, for sure. I, mean, I was lucky enough, I, I say, going through my life, hiding my disability, because I had this like perspective of like, all the challenges I was going through because I wasn't getting the support I needed, right? Mm. And I saw how companies are treating every other person, right? And I, again, not, you know, not understanding how I could talk about the accessibility issues I was facing, right? The the mindsets of people, those type of things really kind of shaped me when I came to LCI, which happens to be the largest employer of people who are blind in the country and based in North Carolina. And I, it, they're a manufacturing, retail, and distribution organization but they wanted to create a new organization that would create upward mobility for people who are blind. And so I joined the company tasked with creating this new business. And like I said, based on my own lived experiences, I said, if we want to create upper mobility, especially in tech related fields, Mm -hmm. we're going to have to address the digital accessibility barriers. This means making sure that websites are accessible, making sure that systems, processes, documents are accessible because I can, I can't tell you how many times I try to apply for a job online Mm. and it just wasn't accessible. Right. If, if, if your website's not accessible, I can't apply to your job online. No wonder you don't have applicants with disabilities in your organization. That's a lot of the misconception, right? People are like, Oh, I don't have anyone with a disability. That's why I don't need to. 
but if you flip it, flip it on the, on the, on the side and say, look, if you had an accessible website, an accessible online application, your interviews were accommodating and more accessible, you may have a whole different type of, you know, uh, uh, recruitment class coming in. But then the second component of what we do at Abler is we provide disability inclusion training and services because we had to change the mindsets of those hiring managers, those leadership, and even coworkers because we needed to change that misconception, like I talked about, the stigmas around it and focus on what can people with disabilities do rather than how can they do it. With the right accommodations, they're going to be able to do this. Let's focus on what they can do now. And so those two yeah. things really build up the demand for talent, right? Mm -hmm. Companies are like, okay, we made it more accessible. We're more inclusive. Now where's the talent? That's the third line of our business. We realized we had to build up that supply. And so we launched a workforce development program to train individuals to pursue careers in tech-related fields. And so we have a program in the state of North Carolina in collaboration with the Health and Human Services to actually train individuals, give them the skills that they need, and set them up for success to enter the, the workforce. And so that allows us to meet the supply and demand uh, you know, balance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. So again, I... <laughs> You're in a space that's, a, you know, not exactly where I've been adjacent to some of the work that I've done. I, I'm a university professor um, mm -hmm. in addition to the consulting work that I do. And one of the areas of research I've, I've been engaged in is is autism in the workplace and yep. and the, the neurodivergent um, and their experiences in the workplace and going through the hiring process and yes. attitudes of employers towards the neurodivergent and coworkers, et cetera. Right. And in interviewing executives for a, an article a few years back, um, I, I, I received kind of that same notion that you were just sharing over and over and over again. Oh, we don't have any neurodivergent people. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's not true. Um, yep. <laughs> there, there's no way that can be true because we know kind of the ratio of uh, of those on the spectrum versus, you know, those who are neurotypical um, yep. and any sizable organization is, is going to have people you just don't know because people aren't sharing. Um, That's correct. Either they're not sharing or you have systems, processes, procedures in place that are systematically screening them out so they don't have an opportunity to be in your organization. And it doesn't mean that they had nefarious intention, that they were trying to keep the neurodivergent away. It, it just means whatever processes they had weren't uh, accommodating um, yeah. to, to individuals that have you know, who, who are neurodivergent. And so anyways, just having these conversations is just so fascinating to me about how, how many people, you know, pretty much everyone I interviewed said, yeah, you know, we, we, we're open to it. We're, we're open to working with this population. Um, you know, we, we would love anyone with the skill set, and, you know, everyone, you know, loves the idea of DEI and inclusivity and belonging. And, you know, I don't know many people who say, I think belonging stupid, um, <laughs> You know, but when it comes down to the systems, the structures of the organization, the mechanisms, you know, that either disproportionately benefit certain populations or disproportionately negatively impact uh, certain populations, that's where we have to take good, hard, long looks. And I think in the disability community, that's a big, broad area, right? That includes so many yes. different types of people and conditions and, and everything. Like, it, it really just means uh, we have to be far more... Um, I don't know, just really uh, self-reflective and challenging assumptions around what we're doing and why we're doing it. And if it's really necessary to do it that way, because uh, the reality is in most cases, no, it's not actually yeah. uh, something we have to keep doing just because we've always been doing it. Well, I think we have to be intentional about it, right? Yeah. And And like you said before, you know, companies more than likely not, ha they have people with disabilities in there and they've bypassed those systems process that try you know, that you know unconsciously have been you know keeping them yeah. out people have passed through they're in there but once you can activate that community to be like here we want to create a safe place for you to self-identify and when you can self-identify you can bring those people to the forefront have their voices heard now you can say look how can we improve these processes how can we improve the the systems what can we do Right. Take a look, internalize that first, see what's going on. How can we do that? And then there's also organizations like us who come and bring actual people with lived experiences because we don't want to just make sure that it's checking a box. 
we want to make sure that it's usable, right? And so going through those processes, have actual people going through it. And when you shift the mindset from, you know, policies and procedures are just about, you know, things on a piece of paper. But when you switch and say, look, these are about experience, employee experiences. Yeah. Now you, you really humanize it. And that changes it because that you're, it, disability is not just about policies and procedures or, you know, compliance. It's about human experiences. And, you know, we often say if something's accessible, it's useful for a few, but, you know, it's mandatory and necessary for a few, but useful for all, right? So if you make that experience a little bit more accessible for these people who really need it, everyone's going to benefit from it. And that's the, that's the beauty of accessibility. And, uh, and I think organizations are starting to see that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I completely agree. If if we fall down the trap of just leaning into a, an, a, a compliance culture, yep. like I'm I'm all for compliance, like we need to <laughs> yep. adhere to legal requirements, and we need to follow our policies and stuff. Um, but hopefully, we can comply while going beyond that to more of a commitment towards um, the values behind what we're trying to do, right? Um, That's compliance just doesn't drive long-term sustainable effort towards things. It's, it's more of a carrot stick kind of an approach, short-term yeah. impacts, not long-term sustainable impacts. So absolutely. Um, what, what are some of those resources and support you would have wanted when you were going through the early st stages of your career that yeah. now you, you see organizations trying to offer um, or, or that they're in a, at least a position to think about offering now? Yeah, I think one thing uh, this morning, I was having a conversation with a, a client who has, you know, employee resource groups. And when they launched their employee resource groups, disabilities was one of the ones they first launched with, which is not usually the case, right? It's usually yeah. down the road, but they started with disabilities as one of those ERG groups, those core ERGs. And I think if there was, when I was going through my career, an organization with a disability ERG and being able to be exposed to uh, other people with a similar experience or who could empathize with me, you know, something I talk a lot about is proximity builds empathy, right? The more we can spend time and we can hear other people's story, we can have a better level of empathy. Here, the people have lived experiences, they can empathize with what I'm going through. I can lean on them if I have any challenges or, you know, experiences that are coming up and also getting the, you know, resources I need. And I think that's, that's something I think a lot of organizations can actually implement is an employee resource group. I also think bringing in speakers, for the longest time, for like oh my, for 17 years of my life, when I had been diagnosed with this degenerating eye condition in college, to the point where I met my very first blind person, 17 years, I wasn't exposed to somebody, right? Having speakers come in, talk about you know lived experience, talk about their journeys, and I think if you you bring these individuals and in, you know that's gonna make a big difference. And then going back to intentionality, we have to make sure. We're intentional about our hiring processes, organizations, right? Making sure that the board represents, you know, mm -hmm. the diversity of your clientele and your employees, but also making sure that your leadership also, you know, has that. And what I realized, like disabilities, the disability community isn't just people who have disabilities themselves, but that also in includes caregivers, right? Yeah. People yeah. who may have children or have a parent or have a spouse, those, you know, um, the more we talk about that as a broader community, that that changes the disability as just being 20% of the population. But now we're talking about the disability community being 46% of the population. Yeah, yeah. It seems like almost everyone's touched by it in some way. Right? And so you like, even had your college roommate, right? That your college yeah. friend, right? That's yep. I mean, having that conversation. I don't know when the last time you talked about that, but you know, it, it, this our conversation may have brought that back up to think about that, yeah. friend, right? We all have somebody you just don't realize as you mm -hmm. start to have these more of these kind of conversations, you realize, oh, I am closer than I am, than I'm further than, you know, I'm much closer to it than, than I realize. Yeah. And, and one of the things that sometimes comes up in these DEI conversations is, you know, sometimes you'll have the privileged group who will yep. feel like their privileges are being stripped away, you know, and so they, they it's kind of like this, um, this frustration with their, their current condition to, as we're trying to be more inclusive and accommodating to all these other populations, they interpret that as their, their yes. rights or, or their, you know, whatever they're being stuck being taken away. And it's not really, it's just a matter of, of 
leveling the playing field and providing equity, et cetera. But I do understand where people are coming from when they have that concern. Um, but to your point earlier, when we talk about accommodations and accessibility and we talk about belonging and just creating a space where everyone is safe and has opportunity and access, that it's like a rising tide lifts all ships. Like that helps everybody. And the fact is, whether you personally are, are facing a disability or you, you're a caregiver for someone or, or an adjacent, you know, uh, yep. community member, coworker, uh, family member, whatever, um, w- w- we tend to all kind of be touched by it. And so it, it really does benefit everybody by having mm-hmm. these types of mindsets and approaches and practices uh, within our teams and within our organizations. Uh, and, you know, if we can emphasize that, maybe we can help reduce some of the resistance that some people have if they feel like, you know, why are we paying so much attention to the disability community? You know, one of the reality is we haven't paid so much attention to them. And that's part of why we have the issue. <laughs> so, exactly. um, but, but, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, you probably hear that or those types of comments all the time. Yeah, for sure. You know, what I often talk about is, the disability community is the most inclusive group. We'll take you. We'll take anybody, right? And people may come temporarily. You may break a leg. You may break your arm, right? Mm. Something may happen that temporarily you have a temporary disability, right? And as we get older, we're more likely to get a disability, right? Mm-hmm. I think people think about the image of what disability is. At least I, you know, as I was growing up, it was somebody in a wheelchair, right? It's yeah, the yeah. parking spots I saw, right? That's what disability was to me as a child growing up in North Carolina. It was only after I, you know, going, getting into this community, realizing it's a spectrum. There's people all over the levels and there's so many different types. But again, not everyone is born with it. They yeah. acquire it throughout their life. Like myself, I acquired it when I was in college. And to be able to, this can happen to anyone. I People get it at all ages. And so mm-hmm. the more we can think about it, 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 it's going to benefit everyone, right? And you're more likely, and every day, 10,000 people turn 65 or older, right? And those individuals are more likely to get a disability. That's just, the statistics show us that. So, you know, when you think it's not about me, it doesn't touch me, or it doesn't impact me, it's going to impact, right? At some point yeah. in your life, it's going to impact you. So if we think about it, it's going to improve everyone's life and everyone's experiences. And, and I also talk about COVID, right? That's almost a way we, the whole country the whole world became you know had a momentary disability right we had to figure out how to way to make it more accessible right moving to remote working that's an accommodation that was immediate we were able to do it but for so many years companies wouldn't make that accommodation for people who actually needed it who, like myself if you can't drive how do you get to work pre-uber right pre-taxis like those type of things so I mean, you realize we can all be impacted at any given time so we might as well plan for it now yeah, yeah, well said. Well, I note the time, John, and we're gonna have to wrap up here pretty quick. But I, I thought maybe we could just take a few minutes um, exploring any trends that you see, uh, particularly in in relation to employment, unemployment rates, employment rates with uh, people with disabilities, and then we can wrap things up. Yeah, right now I think when we talk about the unemployment rate for people with disabilities, I mean we're talking about ranges from twenty twenty percent of you know, people like twice as much, two to three times as many people are unemployed than people who are able-bodied, right? And But when we think about the technology that's out there, remote working, you know, we're talking today on Zoom, these type of technologies are creating yeah. a much more accessible experience for people. And so if we lean into, you know, how can we create more uh, accessible opportunities for people? How can we meet people where they are? I think we're going to be able to, to, to really uh, address some of those, you know, barriers that have kept people out of the workforce. And I also think we need to have those conversations like we talked about. Open up, you know, don't be fearful of saying the wrong thing. We need to have open dialogue, change the mindsets about disabilities in the workforce and make it something that's, you know, we can talk about and we can support. And I think finally, we really do need to be intentional about it. We have to intentionally recruit, look for, you know, organizations that have neurodiversity organizations or, you know, targeting people who are blind or deaf or hard of hearing. We have to be intentional. Go to where those people are rather than just saying, oh, we built it and they will come. You have to be intentional about making a difference if you want to address this uh, unemployment rate. Yeah, well said. John, this has just been a pleasure. 
as we wrap up, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate this. People can reach me at johngsamuel.com, johngsamuel.com. That's my um, personal website. And then you can learn more about Abler at ablr360.com. That's ablr360.com. And I'm also active on LinkedIn. So please connect with me, John G. Samuel. And I'm just so thankful. I'm really excited to connect with people, have this conversation. You know, I want to create a safe place. Let's be intentional about breaking down those barriers and we can create a sense of belonging for all people. So thank you, John. Thank you, John. It's been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what John can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.